Welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. God said I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foamed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadow lark. So God made a farmer. Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. The audio you're going to hear today is actually from our live chat um, where we talk about integration rather than segre- segregation for a productive homestead. And um, it was a good live chat and uh, just kind of edited it up for uh, audio for the podcast. I think you'll enjoy it. There is some pictures that I had in the live chat that I'm kind of walking around my property. I'm showing some things. I did a pretty good job of, of telling you what I'm seeing in this audio. So I think you can get the picture. Hope you enjoy it. And let's just jump right into it. Using integration rather than segregation for a healthier, more productive homestead. Now, there's that's a mouthful. So I'm going to explain a little bit of what that means. And uh, we're going to just get into some practical practices of that on your homestead. The The phrase comes from permaculture. It's recognized as uh, Holmgren's uh, eighth permaculture design principle. And um, and we're going to look at just how that happens, how, how integration can be applied. Uh, to your homestead to benefit it, to uh, make the most of it, to make it more productive, to make it more efficient. I think I should have put that in the in the title as well. Uh, it's a big part of efficiency. Well, what, what does the phrase mean first? Let's just look at that. It, it takes this design principle, it, it kind of takes the teaching of stacking functions, which means that each element in a design uh, has more than one function. We've talked about that before. I did a podcast on that, actually. Uh, and, and you take all these elements and they have more than one function and then you take them into practice by, um, um, by through integration, you, you work those elements into your system design, your homestead design. So it's, it's really where the rubber meets the road. It's taking that stacking functions. It's taking each individual item that you've built multiple functions on and it's placing them in the system. Where do you put it? Because not only does it have a function, that function is going to a lot, dep- a lot depend on where you have it on the homestead. So uh, naturally, having a design that takes the most advantage of each one of those elements is really important. And that's where Holmgren, in his, in his book, on his principles, his 12 principles of permaculture, he really gets down into that because he's talking about design principle. And he's talking about integrating these things into the system design. So it's, it's really important. It's played a, a part on my homestead. You know, I talk about uh, edge, using edge, and it was, it's definitely the, the most used thing on my homestead. But this one's a, a close second in the sense that um, I'm trying, and I'm still doing it. It's not there yet, uh, but, but I'm trying to, to implement this to make it a more efficient and more productive homestead. Guilds are part of that. We'll talk a little bit about that building guilds because um, in guilds are exactly what that is. It's taking a, a system function and working in a, a, an element of, of of functions and working them into your homestead is what a guild is. Let's just look at a guild. Let's look at a diagram of a guild. Here's here's one example of a guild. You have a fruit tree, which is going to be your your uh, uh, kind of your overstory of what you got going beneath it. Then you're going to drop down a little bit, and you got the fruit uh, bushes and shrubs that are like your mid height in this example of a guild. Then you're going to have um, uh, plants insectary plants, pollinator plants, nitrogen fixing plants. You see all kinds of plants going on here and you see ground cover and you see mulch, uh, all of this working together symbiotically, um, together benefiting one another. You have, of course, the fruit tree is doing a few things. You can see something that's even missing out of this example would be a climbing, um, uh, something climbing you could use that tree as a trellis even for certain things you wouldn't want to overdo that of course especially a small tree you could choke it out but uh you could even add a climbing something climbing here uh, some kind of a squash a bean uh cucumber um you know there's a bunch of things we'll talk about that a little bit on on in a minute uh but again you see several things working together uh, the fruit tree so it could be a trellis it could be shade um it's a support system there the uh, mid Fruit bushes and shrubs again are 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 uh, 
providing shade for the things that are lower, like your, your ground covers and things. The ground cover, of course, is shading the, the ground, helping with moisture retention. You could even have something we'll talk about in a minute is some kind of a, a, a root, uh, something that's going to dig down and, and to kind of break up the soil and aerate the soil uh, in there as well, like a root vegetable, some kind of like a daikon radish or something like that. It's going to actually penetrate or come free or something with a heavy root system that's going to go through and penetrate the uh, the, the soil. And the mulch uh, plant, uh, the ground cover plant, could actually do that. Uh, something like come free, it could be both. You could actually, some of these plants could actually serve multiple functions. Again, pollinators. So you got flowers, you got they're coming in to benefit one another. You're going to have these bees flying in, butterflies coming in, all kinds of things uh, coming in for pollination purposes. You have um, uh, the things that are drawn in the in the other insects, the things that are going to be good for it, of course. Mulch, that could be plants, that could be actual wood mulch or some other kind of mulch. We talked about that a couple uh, live chats ago. And nitrogen fixtures, these are legumes, uh, beans, uh, anything that's going to put nitrogen in the soil. So you see, there's one example of a gill. Now, I'm working on building guilds on my property uh they don't all look like that uh, they definitely don't look like that yet um but it's something we're working on implementing but it, and i'll show you some uh, a small example of that i don't do and you've probably seen it if you watched my live tour video was this is an apple tree that i have growing along a fence right here and i've boxed this in and i had several of these down along this fence row and right next to this apple tree you see in this little box we we're building a it's the beginning stages of a guild. We have a few things going on here. We have plantain. The plantain is serving a couple functions. One, it's a dynamic accumulator. Um, so it's, you know, it's bringing up nutrients. And as the leaves die back, they're feeding the soil. It's creating a, a dead mulch. Plus the, the plantain in its live form is creating a live, a living mulch. Uh, we actually have some flowers in there. You see, uh, uh, I can't remember what kind of flowers we have in there, but there's a couple flowers in there. It's going to draw in some pollinators. There's actually, now that's not something I planted, but there's creeping Charlie coming in on the backside there. It's kind of a blurry picture. You can't really tell. I clicked this off of the video actually. Um, but you see some, some creeping Charlie. It'll come in and kind of probably fill in that backside of that box, which is going to create a living mulch there to a ground cover mulch right at the ground level. Uh, what I don't have here is shrubs, but you see up on the higher sides here, I've got these herb boxes on both sides of this with herbs. Now, those are doing a few things. They're actually bringing in good pollinators, and some of those herbs are actually repellents for bad insects. So you're getting this this odor, this strong odor there that's actually going to drive away a lot of harmful uh, destructive insects. Uh, some other things are going on here. Of course, plantain has a deep tap root, so it's going down deep. It's drawing up those nutrients. It's aerating the soil because it's uh, because of that deep tap root. Um, it's also because it's a ground cover. It's retaining moisture around that tree better, helping the uh, the tree itself to to get more moisture. It's also um, uh, creating a great environment for uh, microbiology, your worms and your other microbes and things like that in the soil that are that are working, just working hard for you to to make the best growing environment for that tree and for everything living in there. Now, I can definitely add some more things even to this little box. We could put some comfrey in here. We could put even a, a small bush or something. That's gonna, or we could even put a trellising thing. It could use that fence and the tree itself for a... Um, uh, to vine up and walk up like some beans or something yeah, or some peas or anything so peas might even be better because it's gonna be lighter for a small tree like this and it couldn't damage it um so you have you have several things you could work around one little guild like that now we're trying to do that on every tree you know i've come free around some i have actually some squash plants going around some cantaloupe things like that and we have a lot going on around different parts and i'll show you some more here in a few minutes of some other things we have going on but you see that a guild um, is doing a lot of things a good permaculture guild it can it really there's like seven functions that a, a good seven components really of a good guild i mean if you have everything you should have it could have in a proper guild and it, it starts with food okay a guild should be providing food for you if it's something you're you're managing you're working for you're part of that system too it should be providing for you just like it's providing for those because you're part of that ecosystem you're part of that and um, so many times i hear yeah, i see these statements like boy the world would be better off just humans were pulled out of the equation and this and that we're part of the environment too we're part of this ecosystem we just need to not misuse it and permaculture does that it talks about the fact that we don't want to take more than we give back and you know and always have a good supply and and you know keep these things functioning properly uh we need to be fair about the fair use and all that of, of what we take and what we give 
and on a level, we're part of this system. So, of course, this guild should provide for us as well. So it should be food for us. It should be food for the soil. That's number two. It should provide something, nutrients, um, um, uh, back into that soil, which the, we, you know, it could be the dying back. It could be nitrogen input. It could be a lot of different things there on the ways it's giving back uh, to the uh to the soil um, one of the ways i do that is with comfrey we do a lot of chop and drop i'll talk about that more in detail here in a few minutes but you know it's one way we feed the soil back um it should have what's called diggers or miners things that deep rooted plants tap roots what whatnot trees anything that will drive a, a roots deep to dig through the soil it, it reaches into the into the soil brings up minerals to the surface it's called a miner or a dynamic accumulator that word gets overused <laughs> but that's it um and and they're great for breaking up the soil making it soft allowing for air and water to work down the soil for the other plants and they could be root crops like i said trees it could be deep taproot stuff like plantain dandelion comfrey there's some other good ones um uh, also you know diggers and miners can be insects i mean you have worms you have other insects you have ants you have i mean um termites beetles even mice i mean you have and all these things can work if if, if they're kept in control now anything that gets out of balance in your system is going to cause you problems so there's a balance to all of that but that stuff's going to be present you're always going to have some insects you're always going to have some worms if you have good healthy soil all these things are going to be present in that soil and and yeah sometimes they're doing some bad things but a lot of times they're doing a lot of good things too they're really working that soil and doing a lot of it. they're part of the system and and the system everything's just working together i don't remember who it was but i read a quote one time and he said he said you don't have you you only have to just tug on the root of a plant in the wilderness to realize everything's connected i mean it digs deep and it pulls up and it grabs stuff as it comes up and pulls up out of the soil and all these things are connected and it has worms and bugs hanging on the roots and there's these you know uh, nitrogen nodules hanging there and there's just all this stuff and then you, you dig up the hole you see all the other roots kind of intertwined into that into that hole it's all working together and just the the insects the bugs the animals the plants the trees the you know the, the water everything working together and we need to be part of that working together and especially when we implement that on our own properties so again those things work together and you need them you just need them in the right amounts and not to have an overabundance of any one of those things or it can start becoming a problem another aspect of the or another uh, component rather of the uh of the guild would be ground cover it protects the soil from the sun uh, helps to retain the moisture helps keep weeds down which weeds is a uh, relative term isn't it but you know you what you plant there you want to cultivate certain things there and this could be anything that crawls across the ground or is just very low and thick it could be like a sweet potato vines pumpkin cucumbers any kind of squash um, it can be ground cover like clover uh, it can be something with large leaves like comfrey. Um, it can be uh, it can be a lot of different materials. Uh, it can also just be things you put on the ground that aren't actually planted in the ground. It can be you know grass clippings. It can be uh, straw, uh, hay, um, uh, wood chips. It can also be you know, rock and 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 things like that. I mean, we talked about the mulch before, but ground cover is important in a guild. Um, climbers, like I mentioned, was missing from that one example. Um, climbers are things like cucumbers uh, uh pole beans peas um some squashes that'll climb up Th these things are are important can be used in a guild also and they can do a lot of things Th what they're really doing is they're giving you food right okay but they're also providing you know some things for the the system i mean beans for example can put you know it can you can cut the roots off and it puts nitrogen back into the soil i mean there's things you can use them for that are beneficial for things other than than just you know just climbing up and providing you food they also do other things you want some supporters um in a system like this uh, these are these are the stronger items these are the the trees the large bushes corn sunflower the tall things the heavy things the things that are structural and and, and are set up that will provide some support for the other parts of the system it can't, doesn't even have to be a plant in a, in a guild system it can be a building it can be a wood trellis, something you've built. Um, it can be it can be a structure as well. Uh, that can be the main part. My house is, is a is a main structure of a guild that's beside a garden beside my house. It provides climbing area. It provides um, it provides a a, a, a heat sink. 
So it's uh, thermal mass. I mean, it's doing a lot of things that are that are making it part of that guild. So it can it can be more than just a plant. And you also need protectors, or should have protectors. And that's anything that helps protect your guild is a protector. That can be insects, uh, beneficial insects. That can be strong smelling plants that will drive away harmful insects, like I showed you with the herbs. Um, we can have uh, uh, onion, garlic, lemongrass. Certain flowers, um, like marigolds and such, can, can drive away harmful uh, insects, repel them. Um, it can also be uh, animals, like lizards. Um, it can be insects, like praying mantis, uh, ladybugs. It can be um, uh, larger animals, even. You know, I actually consider my dog part of my garden's guild as a whole. She's a little yapping thing. You know what she does? She keeps rabbits out of my yard. She keeps squirrels out of my garden. She keeps birds a lot of times from eating my garden because she's out there just chasing stuff away constantly. You know, a fenced in backyard, she's constantly just chasing anything away that's going to harm my garden. She's part of that guild. You know, she's a useful part of the guild. So she is a protector of my garden. Um, uh, living fences can be a protecting of the protector of the garden. Things like that. So anything that's protecting your guild. So guilds are an important part of this concept of this in integration, not segregation, where we're integrating things into our system that are beneficial. Um, let's talk about some things I've done. Let's just look at some things. Well, not all this is things I've done, but let's just talk about some some examples rather. And some of them are things that I'm doing here. Some of them I'm just going to bring in some examples from other uh, places. But uh, one thing we'll look at is uh, is placing herbs. Now you just seen a little bit of that in that one picture. But uh, placing herbs in places that will benefit is important. And you can see here we have our herb garden. Now, how does this benefit? I mean, you have a variety of herbs. That's one thing. But how does this also work as part of a, of a integration into my homestead? Well, for one thing, if you've watched the, my, my video, my uh, tour video, um, you might have seen that these are just about four steps out of my back door uh, of my kitchen, uh, where my kitchen is. So, um it's an herb garden that is, it's it's uh, efficient, and it does support because it has guilds around it that it supports. Um, it's part of the system. It supports uh, 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 certain species in my garden, and it repels certain insects in my garden. Um, but one thing it does is it really provides for us. It provides food for us, and it's part of that system. And it's close, and that's really important because when you're when you're designing a system, you want to make your system efficient. That's really important to be efficient. Uh, with your system. So um, putting herbs in a place where you can get to them. Also keeping compost close to your herbs where you can feed them. And also the dead stuff can go to the compost. Having a compost system in it, which we'll talk about that in a more minute as a structure. But, you know, having all this within relative distance to where it's usable, efficient, and productive is important. So having your herb garden close is probably the thing you're going to use in a way where it's you're picking it fresh and using it in your kitchen. And anything you're going to have to go to a lot you want to keep close. You want to keep usable in an area where you can get to it quickly. So, I mean, that's just one of the things you can do. That's one of the things I'm doing, rather. Another thing you can do is plant uh, strategically. These are marigolds. Uh, I've got these all over my garden, okay? What do they do? Well, you see right here in this picture of this one, um, this is right from my garden. There is a bee. There's a bumblebee on that, and it's pollinating. And, you know, it's it's great. It's, it's drawing in pollinators for one thing. Another two, marigolds is, number two is marigolds are really good for, for repelling certain insects. So it's good to just scatter marigolds around through your property. They, they do a lot to protect. Um, although this year, I don't know that it worked all that well. We had have been having a pretty crazy year with the insects, but I'll tell you what, it is getting better. I'm just doing little things. I'm seeing a lot less bug pressure here recently. Now they've already done a lot of damage, but, um, we also, uh, it's getting better and that's, that's great. We're getting good harvest anyway. I mean, I don't mind sharing a little, they're probably taking a little more than I would have liked this year, but, uh, we're still getting plenty of good, good produce from our garden. Um, but you see that, that using things like that throughout the garden, uh, can be very, very beneficial. And just being strategic about it, uh, and and again, that's part of an integration. You're integrating things into your gar into your garden, into your homestead that are useful. Uh, something that I'm just from the very beginning, I was really huge on. Matter of fact, when I did that video, I was talking about a minute ago. A lot of people commented on this, and a lot of people said, "I want to do that too." And that's placing dynamic accum accumulators strategically throughout a garden, and uh, this can be used in support of the garden for chop and drop fertilizer. It can be used for ground cover. Um, 
A lot of times these plants have culinary and medicinal and or medicinal uh, purposes as well. Comfrey is one, for example, that I'm using a lot of, but it, comfrey is actually not even the best dynamic accumulator. It's just got a lot of other uses that, that, value, that I highly value, and I like it because it's really fast growing. I mean, that, that plantain I showed you earlier, I mean, that's got medicinal and, and, and culinary benefits as well. And um, it, it's also a great dynamic accumulator. It doesn't go as deep as, as comfrey, so it's not quite as good as comfrey as a dynamic, dynamic accumulator, but it has a lot of those qualities, and um, it's just different. Dandelion is a great one. I let it grow in some spots in my garden when it grows up. If it's not you know, choking anything out, I'll let it go. Um, so... But I use comfrey, and and you probably seen that if you if you've been seeing any pictures of my homestead, and you can see here in this picture right at the end of every bed, I have two comfrey plants at the end of every bed, and when these get about as tall as that bed, I just chop them down to about that height, boom. I mean, and that's happening about every two weeks, two to three weeks, I'm chopping a ton of um, of uh, uh, organic material off these plants, and I spread it throughout the garden. Well, some of it will go in the garden, because uh, I'll only put so much. I'll cover the soil in the garden. I will use it in my compost as a compost activator. I will use it to make compost tea. I will use it to feed my livestock. I use it for a lot of different things, but a, a ton of it goes right into the garden as chop and drop. So I like to place dynamic accumulators throughout the garden uh, strategically uh, to be used in support of the garden. And I think that's important. You know, I think we can, I think that's a great way to, uh, to again, integrate, integrate these things into your, you know, so many people would look at comfrey as some kind of just this nuisance plant, a weed. Um, now in some forms it is, if it's, uh, if it's the, uh, a regular, uh, what we call com common comfrey that puts off seeds, it can spread. Now this is a Russian variety comfrey. Um, it grows right where it's put. It, it will only spread if you break the roots up and spread it physically, or you chop it and kind of move it around and it might get a little bit bigger. Um, but it'll only get so big if you leave it alone. I mean, it'll be a plant that's maybe, you know, uh, two feet in diameter and it'll kind of, the leaves will go out maybe three feet total. I, I mean, it won't, it won't be a giant. I mean, it's a big plant, no doubt about it, but it won't spread and just get, you know, take over. Where common common comfrey will buy its seed. These have sterile seeds. They won't do that. Um, so if you're going to use comfrey in a garden, make sure it's a Russian variety, Bocking 4 or Bocking 14 are excellent varieties of that. And most common varieties, of course, of, of the Russian varieties. And that's what you want for your garden. And it will do, commonly, four is a lot of more people use that for, for livestock feed just because it's got bigger more useful leaves um and they use the, the 14 usually more for garden fertilizer and things like that so it's got other purposes but both will work for either it's just because of the leaf size and shape one works better for the, than the other for the other all of mine by the way is, is balking 14 i have no balking four on my property it's all balking 14 um but that you know it's something that's i've had that everywhere we have that just all throughout the homestead to be able to use for chop and drop wherever I have it. And, and I just feed my gardens with it constantly. And that's my, that's my number one fertilizer. That and rabbit manure and quail manure are my fertilizers for my garden. I don't bring any outside fertilizers in. I, I, I just don't. My first year, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you my first year I used, I used miracle grow. I did. I should, I wish I wouldn't have, but I did. Yeah. And, and it gave me a great garden. But ever since then, because I brought rabbits in the next year, started using rabbit manure, started having comfrey on the property, and we just that's what I use now. As I make comp uh, compost tea, uh, I use actual compost from my compost bin from all the cuttings and stuff I take down, dead plants, and I and I use a chop and drop comfrey, and I use a lot of weed chop and drop too. I'll just pull dandelion leaves or plantain leaves, whatever, grass clippings, um, things like that. That's what my that's what my fertilizer is now. But it you know my actual manure part is is rabbit and 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 quail um also a really good now this don't all have to be just about for the benefits of the garden it's it's your system as a whole your whole homestead we're talking about um uh, implementing or integrating these things for your homestead for the whole system and part of your system is animals if, if you have animals now uh so also placing livestock forage plants or trees to tr strategically on your homestead to make them useful for the animals now i've done this in a big way, um, some of you may know that right behind that shed is where my animals are, my quail and my rabbits. There's a there's a pen back there that houses all my rabbits and all my quail. Well, so I walk through that shed through a door in the back, and then there's my animals. And this is the trail leading up to that shed uh, along this on the inside this comfrey trail right here. Um, 
But let's just look at some of the things that are in this picture. Now, I'll, I'll point out, I'll keep this up for a few minutes because I want to point out a few things here. Um, pretty much everything you see here are things that rabbits and quail eat, especially rabbits. Okay, we have a mulberry tree. That's what that big thing is right there in front of the shed. It's a mulberry tree. I cut a ton off that mulberry tree. They eat the, they eat the stems and they eat the leaves. They love it. Okay. That tree actually does it because it's got so much forage on it because I prune it so heavily all the time. It actually stays so thick and full that it never puts off any berries because it's just got so much foliage. That's fine. Uh, actually, the trellis that you can barely tell there's a trellis there, but right in front of that, the trail actually walks up through a trellis. There's actually beans growing on that, uh, pole beans growing on that. Rabbits could eat that. That's really more for me, but they could eat that. Um, off to the right of the picture there at the back, that's actually a grapevine that's spreading out. They actually can eat grape leaves and grapevine. Um, that's an apple tree there. They can eat apple stems. I do cut some off that when I need to prune it, whatever. That can go to the rabbits. All on that trail, that's comfrey. That's rabbit food and quail food. My quail actually like it better than the rabbits do these days. Um, cucumbers on that first trellis there. There's maple trees. I wouldn't feed them that, but they could eat that. And that whole wall on the backside there is sunflower. And there's even broccoli over by the green, greenhouse. And when I get old dead leaves or whatever, that'll go to the rabbits. So I want you to realize, and grass, and of course in that grass is plantain and dandelion and all kinds of weeds growing, what we'll call weeds. Let's just consider for a minute that everything you see in this picture within a few feet of that rabbit pen is something that the rabbits and quail can eat. Think about that. I mean, everything right there. And that's a lot of green. That's a lot of food right there. And they can eat all of it. I mean... I, I couldn't, I, I, there, I would, I would need a hundred rabbits to, to maintain all the, through the summertime rather, uh, anyway, um, to, to take every bit of the cuttings I need to take from that and feed them probably. I mean, it would take that much because I don't give them just pure that probably 50, 50, I give them forage and I give them feed, but I mean, it would take a lot of animals to, uh, to use up all the, um, to overuse rather all the forage I have just right there. And that's not, that's just a piece of my garden within a few feet of their cages. So consider that. I mean, consider the fact that how efficient and productive that is right there. And, and that's strategic. I mean, I planted that stuff. I've got the rabbits there. I got the quail there and I got all this stuff there, especially the mulberry tree for a reason. I find mulberry to be one of the, one of their favorite foods. They love mulberry leaves. Love it. But every bit of that, I mean, they can eat every bit of that. Um, I'm going to keep this up for a minute because I want to point out a few other things before we move on. Consider the other functions of all this stuff. Now, I said this is, you know, the, when you talk about uh, stack, uh, stacking functions, let's consider some of the function stacking going on here. Okay, we, of course, we have animal feed. We have people food. We have, uh, we have a, a, a shade. What you don't see behind that mulberry tree is a lettuce bed strategically placed there because it gets all evening shade. It gets three, four hours sunlight a day that comes in from right in the middle of the day down that right in front of that shed. There's a four foot walkway and you can't really tell the distance there it was about four feet. And as the sun passes over that, it's getting three or four hours of sunlight a day, which is great for the lettuce. That's all it really needs because in the heat of the day, the shed there is on the, on the uh, east side of the property. We're on the west side looking out to the east. So, it's getting, it's not getting that evening sun. So it's not getting beat down that, that, so it's providing shade for some of the plants. It's actually providing a, a privacy screen for me, for my neighbor, neighbor's yard. All that is covering up my neighbor's yard. So it's a privacy screen. So there's another function of it. Um, again, so you got the feed, you got that, that comfrey is actually serving as, as a weed block for that trail. There's a mulch trail all on the inside of that. And then the, the, the root mass on that comfrey is so thick and and deep that the crabgrass and such does not crawl into my path so it's it's actually a weed block as well um let's consider some of the other functions here of course i mean i i just can't get past the food aspect of it. a lot of food there um but you see what i'm saying there's trellises there's ground cover there's shade food for animals food for people privacy screen i mean there's a lot of functions going on right there a lot of functions going on right here. Plus beauty. Let's not let's not uh, you know forget the aspect of that. It's an enjoyable space, I think. Anyway, for me it is. So I mean, it has a lot of purposes right there. Now, originally, right beside the shed in the back there was a compost bin. There will be another one there soon. I had to do some changing around, but again, that's even something else I'd have right there in the system. Another place to ch to drop things, to put things. Part of the system. It's not too far from my house to put food scraps and things in. So again, very useful space. You can do a lot with a small little space right here to uh, have a lot of functions, a lot of service, a lot of integration 
uh, going on in that little piece of property. Um, so now let's consider, uh, let's talk, let's talk next about, I don't have to come back to the other thing. I got my pictures, my screenshots here out of, out of whack with my notes. Um, Let's talk about utilizing water on the property. Let's integrate water. Most people are wanting to get water off the property. It's what the ditch system is. I mean, it's running the water off your property into a ditch, moving it down the road to a creek or a river, boom, out to the ocean. Get rid of it. You know, just get it off your property. That's most people's goal. I don't want no water on my property. Well, permaculture or the homesteader uh, person thinks a little different. Um, we're wanting to utilize that water that's falling on our property. There's a bunch of ways you can do that. You can do that with water catchment systems. Several of you guys have really great water catchment systems. Currently, I don't have one. I mean, right now, we don't have one. We had a new roof put on our house. We don't have any gutters on our house right now. We're, waiting. We're going to get some more gutters put on. And then I gotta, I'm got. i going to actually build a different system than what I had before. Mine was just simple, real basic. I'm going to do something a little more complex, really nice. Uh, but I haven't got around to that yet. So right now, I don't even have a water catchment system, which is, which is bad. I mean, I guess technically I do. I got my pond, and I actually have a small gutter around my deck that dumps into my pond. So I do use some of that water. That's water catchment. I do use some of that water in my garden because it's got, you know, fish waste in it and it's really fertile. So I like to, I like to use that. Um, also have my aquaponics tank, which is fertile water and it's catching water. So I guess I do have some water catchment, but not, it's not intentionally just water catchment. So that's one thing you can do. Something common for, for permaculture anyway is swales. Swales that capture water in the ground in a ditch on contour, and then they slowly disperse that water throughout the property. Um, you can also use creek beds or tile uh, that move water to a more useful location on your property. So these are some ways you utilize water. You, you integrate the water into your system rather than just separating it, rather than just getting rid of it. And I need to do more of that. That's something I need to do a lot more integration of on my property is water use so we can make it more valuable of a, of a element I guess I should say of the, of the property here. So, I mean, it's just something else, you know, that we can work towards in integration. Another thing is, um, buildings and other structures, uh, can be used strategically for multiple functions. A building can be used for storage, of course, wind protection, water collection, a trellis, a thermal mass, all kinds of things. Um, I said earlier, my house is a part of my guild, you know, I mean, it's serving some function, uh, right here on my property. A compost bin can be placed for convenience in the garden, making it more useful, requiring less energy from you, less time, making everything more efficient, more productive. It can be strategically placed. So that right there, too, is something. It's a structure. Sheds, greenhouses, all these things are structures that, you know, they can serve these functions as well. What else can you integrate into your, into your homestead? Insects. Insects can be valuable. A few years ago, now there's there's a couple ways you can bring insects on your property. The best way is to attract them, plant things that are going to you know that they eat, that they like to be around, an environment friendly to those insects. But you can speed up the process by bringing them in. You know, a couple years ago, we brought in praying mantis and ladybugs on the property, and I'll probably end up doing that again because I haven't seen a lot of evidence of them. I think they left, <laughs> but anyway, I want more back because of insect problems. These are really good for controlling other destructive insects like aphids. A ladybugs are really good for aphids, uh, praying mantis, aphids and bigger insects even. So you, you have something there that you can bring into your property. You can integrate them into your property. Again, best to draw them in because if you draw them in, they're more than likely going to stay. Unfortunately, one of the things that draws them in is the food they eat, which are the destructive insects. So, and the process can be, the process can actually go destructive before it gets better if you're drawing them in with the bad insects. So sometimes it's better to get a jump on it and bring them in with the bad insects and not have that two, three years of a lot of destruction um, before, you know, they start drawing them in in a heavy enough manner to control them. So another thing that you want, you can integrate on your property is animals, integrating animals onto your property. Um, now we talked about feeding the animals and using them on the property in food, but how about using the, the chickens or something right over your property? You could do this with, with rabbits. You could do this with chickens. You could put rabbits in a tractor, move them right over a garden. They would actually work the garden. You could, after you've picked it in the fall, you could run tractors or fence it in with electric netting like this. Run your animals over the garden area. Let them fertilize it. Let them pick the weeds clean. Let them dig it up and till it and get seeds and all that out. And, and just give it a nitrogen injection. So you can see that animals become a part of the system. There is a uh, one of our members here in this group, and you, I won't 
call him out my name, but um, he posted some pictures a, a while back of his setup, and he has chicken tunnels around his gardens where the chickens come out of their coop area, and he built these chicken wire tunnels where they go all the way around his garden. What does that do? Well, it's, of course, it's going to keep weeds from creeping into your garden. It's going to have this separation barrier where the chickens are going to be constantly tilling up those weeds and, and keeping it all laid up and not letting like crabgrass and things like that creep into your garden area. Plus insects. Insects are coming in from the outside. Boom. Chickens are going to grab those in a second. Um, pests, mice, things like that. Chickens will tear those things up. Uh, so you have the chickens controlling a lot of things that are doing work for you. They're part of that system. They've been integrated into a system for use, benefiting the garden, the garden benefiting them. So it's all part of that symbiotic relationship where they're benefiting one another. So you have animals as part of that system as well. So as I think you can see, uh, integration rather than separation is really good. I mean, bringing these things together, working them into your homestead, making them part of your system and utilizing everything to the best of its ability. There's an endless amount of ways to do this. I'm just talking about a few examples here today, but there are so many things you can do. I mean, the sky's the limit. And and you're only limited by your imagination, too. There's things out there that you could think to do that maybe other people aren't doing. Um, but there's a lot of ways to implement uh, and integrate uh, things into your property and make them serve more than one function, use properly, benefiting in a symbiotic way the entire system, and uh, making a more effective, efficient, productive homestead for you. So I hope this helps you get a little bit of a grip or give you some ideas. And maybe just helps you understand better the concept and um, and how wise it is really to work this into your system. Uh, I, I feel like gone are the days when we just go out and plant a garden and have a few animals and we separate everything. You know, keep it all separated. And... Um, thinking that's the best anyway. I mean, you can do that. You can survive like that. You can, But if you want to have the most product, productive system, integration is where it's at, I believe. I mean, especially especially on smaller properties. If you're dealing with a, you know, maybe five acres, or, five acres or less, I think integration uh, of these systems is can you know greatly in, in, increase what you're doing uh, by integrating it and working it together. So, uh, of course, anything on any scale, when it gets bigger, it becomes less important. Like we talked about the edge effect. We talked about a lot of things. The bigger that scale gets, the less important it is uh, because there's just going to be natural systems that set up like that. But on a really small scale, which is what I like to talk a lot about because it's what I am, and that's where most people are. Most people are, you know, five acres or less. And these things become really important, especially these permaculture principles become really important, really helpful on those smaller homesteads. So, Hope this helps you, gives you some ideas, and uh, and uh, thanks for joining me. And uh, until the next one, uh, happy homesteading. God bless. Ooh.